Hey, everybody. Hey, you're welcome back or welcome. If this is your first time to a sales hacker community event, happy to have you here. I'm happy to be here. It's been a while since uh, I've hosted one of these. So if you don't know me, my name is Colin Campbell. I lead the sales hacker team at Outreach and I'm really happy to be here with all of you. I'm even happier to be here with uh, Devin Reed, who is the manager of content strategy at Gong. He's also the host of Reveal, uh, the Revenue Intelligence podcast. So check that out if you haven't yet. Devin, thanks for being here, my friend, and uh, welcome back. Thank you. Always a pleasure to hang out with Sales Hacker. You know you're my favorite Sales Hacker host. Don't tell Scott or Alex. Uh, Scott. Happy to end 2020 talking about what worked in 2020 and doing it with you. So I'm, I'm pumped. Me too. Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, so listen, we've got some really cool stuff to dive into. But before we do that, oh, geez, I got some housekeeping to take care of everybody. I see some people coming into the live session, which is awesome. That's the way we like to do it. If you're watching the recording, that's cool too. Um, but if you're here for the live session, I know that you're really here because you want to have some fun and meet some people and ask Devin some questions and Tell me to stop talking. Uh, so we want to see you interact. Let's make this feel like a very full room because it is. Go to the chat down at the bottom of your screen and uh, let us know who's here. Uh, just introduce yourselves. Maybe tell people your role. Uh, share what your favorite holiday meal is. If you've got travel plans. And while you're doing that, I'll also remind everybody that we are recording this. So if you have to step away and take that end of month, end of quarter call, it's all good. Uh, you should definitely prioritize that. And uh, we'll send you the deck afterwards too, right, Devin? Absolutely. Cool. All right. Not seeing people introduce themselves in the chat though. There you go. Hi, Gigi. Gigi from Germany. She's a sales enabler. Hello world. Right. You asked, uh, well, you asked a good question. Maybe we can answer it. It was, uh, there we go. Now a bunch of people are popping in. Uh, favorite holiday meal. I don't have one for Christmas. And this is going to sound really bad. I have a really nice bottle of tequila on my counter and I'm just waiting for the 24th to be off work and open that bottle. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm looking forward to. Not a meal. I'll still eat, but very excited for that. You know, not to bandwagon too much or make it seem like this is a happy hour because it's really only 2 p.m. where I am, but I've got a bottle of champagne that I've been saving there you go. for Christmas Eve as well. But my favorite meal is always uh, just ham. It's nothing fancy. Just, you know, I think it's like the only time of year I'll actually bake a whole ham. So I get excited for that and all the sandwiches after. There yeah, you a lot of people, uh, somebody said espresso martinis, Bailey's on Christmas. That was dangerous. What tequila is it? My favorite is 1942. Favorite. I didn't say drink that all the time. If you look at how much that costs. The one I have on my counter was a gift and I cannot remember the name because I had never heard of it before. If you hit me, hit me on uh, DM on LinkedIn, I'll send you a picture of it. I can't remember the name. It's in Spanish and I'm very bad at Spanish. Hey, Jim McKevitt, welcome. This is Jim's first sales hacker webinar. Welcome, Jim. We're going to have some fun. Uh, really good group of people. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, um, we're going to get started. Uh, so here's what we're talking about today. Basically, Devin uh, and all of the geniuses over at Gong, they spend a lot of time analyzing with um, the AI and their data science team, analyzing sales conversations and what makes them effective. And so over the last year or so, there have been several insights that have been pulled out that I think were especially surprising, especially useful, and some of them are really counterintuitive. Um, so that's what we're looking at today. This is like the best of the best. You're here for the greatest hits. So with that, Devin, take it away, my friend. Sure thing. It, uh, can you enable screen sharing for me? Of course I can. Look at me not enabling screen sharing. And yeah, this is like if anyone uses Spotify, it's kind of like the Spotify wrap up that they give you at the end of the year. It lets you know what you listened to, what you liked. I was surprised. I, I had some really weird songs on my wrap up, mostly because I actually listen to songs without lyrics on repeat when I write. So what it told me was that I had these kind of weird songs as my top three that I spent a lot of time writing, which is which is good. You but, and me both. Yeah, I was in the top 0.5% of listeners to the Swiss Army Man soundtrack because that's what I listen to every day when I work on repeat. Nice. Can you see anyway, this? Uh, can you see the slide? Okay, Colin. Yeah, and it's beautiful. All right. 
So yeah, we're going to go over the five best data back sales tips of 2020. Uh, Colin kind of prefaced it a little bit, but what we do at Gong is we have a team called Gong Labs, where we, it's myself and a team of data scientists. I'm the only one without a PhD. I think most of them have two, some three. And uh, what we do is we start to look through all of the different sales interactions that our platform captures. Uh, so revenue intelligence platform captures emails, calls, and web conferencing meetings. Then we start to analyze buyer and seller behavior to see what works, what doesn't. And as Colin said, a lot of times it's really surprising. And so that's a lot of what we're going to look at today. And specifically, as happy as I am to say goodbye to 2020, I, I'm not one to believe in like new year, new me, the same guy, but I'm very much excited for the new calendar year. And so to say goodbye to 2020, we're going to look at all the things that worked really well. I love this slide. We analyzed over 500,000 calls. That's correct. Some of the reports are a little bit different. Um, some of them we looked at opportunities. So I think like the first one, we looked at 12,000 opportunities. Some we've looked at other data sets, but for the most part, a lot of our analysis has around that 500,000 call mark. So you can definitely look at these stats and go, hey, there's a lot of data behind it. And a lot of, you know, think about getting better as a sales rep. A lot of times it's doing that rep itself, repetition. You know, here's 500,000 repetitions you can get under your belt and learn from really quickly here. All right, before I hit next slide, do we have a poll? I think we might have a poll, Colin. Yeah, so let's do this. Um, before we get into that first tip, uh, I think you might kind of get what the first tip is from this poll, but I'm gonna launch a poll now. So this is just for every, every attendee, everybody listening now, there's 48 people here now. Tell us, do you, when you're on a video call, you keep your webcam on or off? You can be honest, it's a safe space. Nobody will know if you said you keep it off. Completely anonymous, at least in the, yeah, at least anonymous. for right now. What about you, Colin? Do you leave it on? I mean, other than webinars, like we do now, you kind of kind of have to show up. But like, if you mean you were doing like <laughs> yeah. a sales call, if you're going to sell me something, would you have it on? Yeah, I'm an always on person because I'm remote all the time. I always have been remote all the time. I feel mm -hmm. like that's what I signed up for when I took this job is like the only way that I get any kind of human interaction. Um, and I assume you're an on person as well, right? I'm on almost all the time. Yeah. Unless the yeah. Wi-Fi gets shaky and I have to go off video, but yeah, I like to be on. It holds me yeah. accountable too. I feel like make sure, make sure I'm paying attention to what's on the screen and not my cell phone or some other stuff. Yeah. And it looks like, I mean, so that's 83% of us are webcam yeah. on people and 17% of us are webcam off people, which is what I like to see. Uh, just personal, personal preference, but tell us a little bit about oh wait. Forgot. we have a giveaway we slide i forgot uh yeah anything that you see if you like it a lot of the insights that we'll share today take a screenshot we're in the holiday spirit here at gong so uh post it on linkedin and we'll pick out two people and we'll give you some holiday swag you're already on the great tr track you're, you're, you're playing game with the polls here you'll love it well here we go tip number one kind of called it turn your webcam on Turn your webcam on. So this is the one we looked at about 12,000 opportunities. And Colin, what I was trying to figure out when we ran this report, and we had done a previous one, Chris Orlov did, I think in like 2018, was, you know, kind of in the midst of the pandemic. So I think it was around like July, August timeframe. Uh, everyone went remote. So I was curious, you know, hey, you know, people are talking about Zoom fatigue. Is it real? Are people using webcams? So I was curious, you know, hey, how does using your video or using your webcam help or deter you from winning more deals. Yeah, it's really interesting because yeah. there's a lot of like you people say best practices, but almost never have data, but you guys actually have the data, which is why I'm always so excited to talk to you about this stuff. Yeah, no, it's a good point. And I think some of it too is there's best practices. We all kind of know it and we've all like, it's almost like common knowledge, right? Like, of course it's better. Like if we look here, like, would you rather look at Sabrina, one of the reps on our team? You know, she's got a nice, you know, she's smiling. You can see her energy. Or just a name on a screen, which is like a black box. You don't know if Jan's paying attention, if she's, uh, you know, texting Michael Scott on the other line. Shout out if you get that reference. Um, and so it kind of feels like obvious best practice here. But that's a really good thing to put data behind is make sure that the things we consider truth, make sure they're actually true. Yeah. So we looked at it. Now, this was looking at win rates when you have your, your camera on or your camera off at any point in the sales cycle, any point, beginning, early, middle, or at, at early end. And win rates were 127% higher when there was an active webcam. 
it's mind blowing. 127% higher. Now that does not make your win rate 127%. It means compared to not having one increased at 127%. And if you think about it, like really what this is doing is getting really granular on things we all know that people want and trust and want in sales, which is they want to trust, right? They want to trust their seller and buyer, excuse me, and sellers want to understand their buyers the best of their ability. It's really hard to get to know someone and to truly read them if you're limited to a black box, yeah. right? Like right now I'm talking to you, Colin, you're giving me the little nod, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. First your lips, like, yeah, I get this. That tells me immediately before you even spoke how you're digesting this information versus when people are, you know, hidden behind the black box. So it, that's kind of like, you know, getting it down to kind of brass tacks and simplifying it. But really it's just about understanding each other and having better communication on your sales calls. Yeah, I think it's super important. And one of the, so most of my calls are with my team. I just like one-to-ones, team meetings, coordinating projects, et cetera. And like I'm doing right now, I actually make a point to look at the little green light next to my mm. camera, yeah. which feels weird for me, but my guess is a little bit more natural for you. So I'm not, you know, like this, because this feels yeah. like I'm doing something else. So that's a, that's like, I don't know, to me, it wasn't intuitive and I'm still struggling with it, but I think it makes a difference for the team. Um, I actually have a question here. This is a good question from Leslie Venets. Thanks, Leslie. Sure. Uh, so Leslie's question is, do you start with the camera on or like wait to see what your prospect does and then just mirror them? Yeah, great question. Uh, Nahal is in the chat. She's on my team. She's sharing some of our content. Uh, if you want to check it out, all the things we are going to share today, at least most of them have kind of like a follow-up piece of uh, content you can use to, that has like all these best practices. Uh, and tips. What I always did was I'm always want my video on because if you think of it as an equation of 50 50 right you can have 0% visibility 50% you can see me or 100% I can see you and you can see me. I would ideally go I don't want zero I would like at least my buyer to see me at all times. Because Devin read the person with the beard and the smile and all this stuff. That's a person. And you can start to get to know me a lot better than if it's just the name Devin read, you know, black and white text. Right. It's harder to say no to him, I hope. Uh, it's easier to get to know him and, and you can start to trust the person on the other side. The other thing is when you get started, a lot of times people, if you have your video on as the seller and the buyer doesn't, keep it on because they might turn theirs on. That might be the day where they go, you know what, I'll, all right, Devin's doing it. All right, I'll turn it on. And now you're, you're in. And then the other thing is you can always just ask in a really polite, unassuming way, you know, if I'm selling to you, Colin, and your video's off and the first entry, you know, hey, Colin, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. Cool. Hey, are we going to do a video call today? Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Let me turn it on. Or no, I'm good. I'm good. Not today. Okay, cool. And you don't want to like pressure anyone to turn it on. You don't know what's going on in the background. People could be yeah. moving. People could be, you know, have kids or cats. Who knows? You know, they just don't feel comfortable. You don't want to push, uh, push them. And so, but just that, that nice, easy prompt can help them turn their video on. And no, no yeah. shout out, you know, no, no hate on cats, by the way. I'm a dog guy, but like sometimes there's just like animals in the background. I don't know. I had to go up 15 minutes before we got on here and lock my dogs far, far away from me because they're just going to bark the whole time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So actually, so I, I think we have time. There's another question here. And these are great, everybody. Keep the questions coming. We're going to try to take them throughout. Uh, this one's from Alan. I'm not going to try your last name. I'm sorry. Alan asked if you have any stats on what you wear. And I think the implied question in there is like, do you have, can you show up like I'm dressed right now, which is pretty casual with a hat on and you know, this flannel, or should you dress more like you or even put on a, maybe a, a sports coat? It's a good question. I, I always say is you want to strike the perfect balance of professionalism and authenticity. And those are both things that you get to decide. So I put on a collared shirt today. This thing is actually made of like fuzzy flannel. If you could see it, this is a very, very casual collared shirt. Yesterday I had a hoodie on. Um, and, and Colin, I, have, I find no disrespect in your garb today. Your, your hat is quite Thank acceptable to glad. me. But some companies, you know, if you are selling a $2 million account and you're selling to senior leaders and you work at Salesforce, for example, you might want to put a blazer on because you want to exemplify what, you know, who you are and what you sell. That doesn't mean you can't still sell deals wearing what me and Colin are wearing today or a t-shirt, right? So it's, it's up to you to be who you truly are. 
I think personally, if I saw someone with a sports coat on, I'm like, you, you put a blazer on for this meeting because there's no way at work from home you're wearing a blazer all day. Like, I just don't, I just don't buy it, which is fine. It shows me you're trying to be professional, but that also tells me I'm probably not getting the truest version of whoever is selling to me. So again, it's, it's completely up to the, the seller. But my thing is, you know, look presentable. I think that's a safe bet. You know, look, look, look presentable like you have a job, like you're a professional, um, that you took a shower in the last 24 hours. I think that's a good barometer. I think that's good advice too. Cool. All right. Uh, what's tip number two? Tip number two is how to respond when buyers say they're dreaded. I need to think about it. Mm. And so this was a report we did. As you'll start to find, almost all of these were kind of in in, uh, in response to the pandemic and COVID and the shift that it caused. And you know, a lot of times buyers were hearing, I need to think about it, or excuse me, buyers were saying, I need to think about it because, you know, remember that March, April, May timeline, how much uncertainty and, you know, uh, and how much we didn't know at the time. And everyone knew something was happening. We knew it was really bad. We didn't have a grasp on it yet. So what did everyone do? They froze. And that means that if buyers froze because they're like, hey, I don't, something's coming. I'm not really sure. We're still figuring it out. We're still going to adjust. They weren't moving forward too often right? Deals were stuck in the pipeline. They got, they got, uh, you know, stuck at that stage. And so what I wanted to do was think, you know, put some data behind, I need to think about it as an objection. Now, me personally, I thought that for sure it crushed your win rates. Oh, excuse me. That's what it felt to me as a seller. Mm-hmm. And so what we looked at was like, well, let's look at the occurrence of the phrase. Let's look at if it occurs and if it does occur when. So at the far left, you're looking at the phrase does not occur. And then you're looking at when the phrase occurs early mid funnel. And then the last one is when it occurs late stage. Now you could argue that, well, it appears that win rates increase, which is true, but I don't think you should go seek out, you know, this objection for a couple of points yeah. on your, on your win rates here. But what it did show me was, okay, as a seller, this often feels like, you know, if Colin, you know, I'm trying to sell to you, I'm, you're going to be my prospect all day today. I'm and you're like, ah, you know, Devin, I, l- let me, let me think about it. I got to think about it and get back to you. It feels as a seller, you're like, damn it. Like, what did I miss? Something like I missed the mark here. Something is not good. And so my gut told me that, you know, speaking of kind of putting data behind what we think is true, I was like, let's look at win rates just to kind of solve this. And it does not have a negative impact. Is this, I think, let me look, I'm going to go forward real quick and see, is it this one? Okay. Sorry. So what we did look at though, real quick, it's on a slide here, but it actually does extend sales cycles like 173% or something really long. And so it doesn't kill your deal, but it extends your deal. Now, what the way we figure this out was what happens is when you look at the occurrence happening and the phrase not happening, when the phrase happens, there's a longer amount of time before the next meeting is set. So there's a delay in the next step. That's what's causing the delay in sales cycle. Because if you think about it, Colin, you say, uh, you know, there's two minutes left in the call. I got to go, you know, Devin, let me think about it. We'll, you know, we'll figure out the next call over email. The problem is you're left with an unspoken objection, which means you either are conscious of something that you're not telling me or you're, um, you're uh, unsure of what that objection is, but there's something not quite right. You're not ready to give me the next call. Right. And so here's how you want to respond to that. Now, first is you want to eliminate that gap in the next call, right? You don't want it to be two weeks and then try to get calling on because a lot of people leave their prospect. They let their prospect leave the meeting to go figure out that thing they're thinking about but it's abstract. They're not sure. There's a lot of other priorities. It gets deprioritized. And before you know it, I'll talk to Devin later, whenever that happens, it's not a big deal to me. So for sellers, what you want to do is surface that unspoken objection. And that's what this slide shows you how to do. Now you need to break it up of when the phrase happens in your sales cycle, because that will typically tell you what the root cause of it is. So mid funnel could be, you know, think of that as like your presentation, your demo, maybe your second, third call, that sort of thing. I go, Colin, are you ready to move? Uh, you know, let's go meet with Nahal and have the next conversation, the next demo. And Colin goes, eh, I'm not sure. Let me think about it. Yeah. A great talk track is, Colin, when most people tell me they need to think about it, it's typically because they're not interested or I missed something in our meeting. And then stop. Just stop for a second. Now, Colin, you're probably going to do one of two things. You're going to say, no, no, I'm interested. It's just that dot, dot, dot. And then you're going to voice the unspoken agree, uh, objection. 
Now, whatever, now what you do is take that, that is your agenda item for a day or two or three from now. And you go, Colin, fantastic. Thank you for sharing that with me. Totally understand. Let's set up 20 minutes so we can speak just to that. Okay, cool. Or Colin says, no, you didn't miss anything. I'm just not interested in everything you just showed me. Which is still really good to know because now you're not going to waste your time. Now you can you can still, of course, you know, figure out what what you missed and, and talk through that. But if at the end of the day they're just uninterested, cut the deal loose. Don't waste a bunch of time there. Go find an opportunity where you have a chance to sell. Or it might happen late stage where you're like, you know, 80, 90 percent done. You might have this deal in best case, maybe even most likely. And you go, Colin, you know, what do you think about me sending over the doc you signed to you and Joe to review? I'm not sure. Let me think about it. Well, now you're already pretty bought in, but maybe you just need to figure something else out, which might be the buying process. The buying process changed for a lot of people this year, the approval process, the budget process. And so what you want to do is level with them. Colin, sure. Most people I'm talking to right now have shifted their buying process as budgets have tightened up. I imagine that might be the same for you too. Can I make a suggestion that will help you make the case internally? Again, one of two things. Yeah, absolutely. What are you, what are you thinking? That's exactly, you know, you read my mind. Or you'll just, I'm wrong and you'll correct me. You go, no, actually I'm fine selling it internally. There's just this, there's just this, this gal in the other department. She, she's really finicky if we, do, if we buy something without her getting approval. Would you mind doing a demo with her? Hmm. You see the pattern here? You're always giving, you're forcing your buyer into a choice. Either correct me or agree with me. And either way you have your path forward. There is silence in the chat and the Q&A. And mm -hmm. I think it's because everyone is so wrapped. So this, this kind of blew my mind when I first saw this and you guys shared this with me. Um, my first thought was, they're not gonna say, let me think about it if they've already decided, hell no. Like if they're already totally out, those early stage, I'm, let me think about it, people are uh, just putting you off in my mind most of it, more often than than later stage so that's what blew my mind here is that like this is almost like a truth finder these responses um help you determine whether they actually just have to think about it or there's this hidden objection this is so cool um we got we do have a couple questions now so sam ray uh asks what if they say they just need to talk about it internally like that's their you know, I need yeah. to think about it. You respond and they say, eh, I've got some internal conversations I need to have. That's when you, you just like queue up the curiosity and go for your understanding the buying motion. Yeah. Oh, perfect. I'm, I'm glad you feel confident in moving, you know, moving forward. Who all do you need to talk to and what do they care about? Maybe do single questions. I would never tack on uh, multiple questions in one, but you know, who are you talking to? What do they care about? Um, how, how has this gone poorly in the past? How has this gone well in the past? Because what they just told you is like a soft, it's, a, it's not a verbal, but it's a buying signal. Like they're going to talk internally to go get this done. And I do it too. I'm doing it right now with someone uh, who's, who's selling to me. I'm like, cool, this actually looks really good. Uh, let me go talk internally. That's me because I'm very casual and speak. I'm not going to say, yeah, this self sounds good. You know, and then I just like list all these to do's out front. But I know in my head all these things I need to do. And if the buy or my, the rep I'm working with asks me, I'm happy to share those with them. Because in my head, I've already decided I want to move on this, right? We just not all, you know, you got to remember by human beings as a whole are not very open communicators. We're not the best communicators, even if you're great in sales. So don't assume just because your buyer hasn't explicitly told you, you know, preemptively on their own, you can still pull that thread and just start to ask questions and get a full understanding. And that's how you really take, take control of the buying process. Yeah, Mike Friedman had a good point here too, which is that, uh, or, or kind of like a, a question is that I wonder if the data is different year over year. And I understand if you don't have this, Devin, but yeah. it would be interesting to know how much of this is specific to this year and how yeah. much of it is kind of just a, the way this objection has always worked. What's your gut feeling on that, even if you don't have data? I don't have data yet, but I'm going to, you're going to see a lot of trend data next year from me because this year was so radical, you know, feels radical. We'll see next year if it is in fact as radical as we had hoped or, you know, as, as it felt rather. Uh, and we'll keep doing year over year trends to kind of see. Um, my gut tells me that this year, and maybe I'm being biased for myself, I've never had more to think about. <laughs> there has been so much change that I feel like I'm always kind of figuring out the next thing. And, you know, the playbook has been erased or drastically changed. So my gut tells me 
2020 gave our buyers a lot to think about. Um, and it wasn't necessarily what it felt like next year. It's, it's tough to say, you know, it's tough to say, but I have to imagine, um, there will hopefully be less to think about. So there'll be yes. more certainty. Um, so that tells me that either one of two things, the objection will still occur at the same rate, but the meaning has re changed or reverted back or the meaning of the objection is the same and it will occur more or less depending on the level of uncertainty that we see next year. Interesting. I can't wait to have a follow-up conversation with you now <laughs> and find out. There you go. Great questions, everybody. And good point, yeah. Mike. Very good questions. All right. The next one, and this was a fun one, uh, was to ask for, uh, oh, it's time. It's actually interest. It should say interest. <laughs> ask for interest in a cold email. So use the typo. So one of the cool reports that we did, and this came, this had nothing to do with the pandemic. This came specifically from my hunch as a salesperson, having written hundreds or thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of cold emails. At the end of every email, no matter how well I personalize it, and I've got the why you, why now, at the end, there's always that CTA. Should I ask for time? Hey, Colin, does Thursday at 2 p.m. work to talk about the above? Or should I just ask if Colin's interested at all? I have seen amazing, uh, you know, LinkedIn. We talked about LinkedIn before the show. I love LinkedIn. A lot of times you get uh, good examples, like, you know, VP of something shouting out this SDR at this other company, like, this is what great looks like. I love this email. And I noticed that the first half looks all the same, personalized, you know, tying to the value, why you, why now? But there was never a consistent CTA. I saw both. I saw everything work, you know, seemingly to work. So I wanted to look at the data and get an understanding of like, hey, is there really a better, like is one better than the other? And so what we did is we looked at cold emails and we looked at the CTAs. Now the headline gives it away. Interest drastically outperforms asking for time. About a clean 2X. Now let me break down what this means here. So the specific CTA on the far left is specifically asking for date and time. Open-ended CTA asks for the meeting, but does not contain day or time. Are you open to meeting? Are you open to chatting about this? Interest CTA does not include either of those, but simply asks for interest if you're, you know, if you're interested in the above topic. So what this showed me immediately was one, I was pretty damn surprised because I had always been taught the specific CTA. Reach out to Colin, make it easy for him to look at his calendar. If Thursday at four o'clock is not available, he will tell you the next availability and then you have your meeting. You can go for it. What this shows though, is a new era of prospecting, a new more effective version of it, which is gauging and asking for a conversation, not time, not meeting, not a resource. Because at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're a salesperson reaching out to someone who does not know you. So you're a stranger even if they know your company. And you're saying, hey, I think we should meet. And what you're asking for is their time, which is our most valuable resource as human beings. It's not money. You can go make more money. You can't make more time. And it's too presumptive. It's too early. It's too premature. Because what happens in our brains is before you decide if I'm going to allocate time towards something, you have a, a pit stop and you go, is this worth my time? Is this, am I even interested in doing this thing? And even if you're not interested, then you decide this is a priority and you're not a priority at a cold email stage. You're just not. And so I was really happy to share uh, when we published this, like kind of set the record straight. And again, always go test this for, you know, folks listening, go test this for yourself, A, B test, make sure it works for you. But um, yeah, it was really great, great to know and, and uh, share some examples in the article about uh, the interest ETA. I love that you called out to test it too. Um, I was just sitting here thinking, I wonder if there's a persona or like a role or a type of per I don't know type of person who would prefer that you just ask for their time whether or not they're interested because it saves a step like they're really worried about having to then just do another email to schedule yeah. so um, yeah well, good point well, you have fifteen not fifteen percent of people but there's still a fifteen percent success rate right yeah so it's actually, not that it does not work at all it's just one is significantly more effective right. And then really quickly, the way we, I, I meant to mention this in the beginning, the way we measured success was if a meeting was booked within 10 days. So this wasn't, did you get a reply? It wasn't if you got an open because, you know, replies could be unsubscribe or never talk to me again. And we don't want those. So this was specifically if you got a meeting within 10 days. 
And by the way, everybody, just in case anybody else had this question, uh, somebody asked, what does CTA mean? I answered it in the chat too, but CTA is call to action. So it's that thing at the bottom of the email where you're asking, you know, can we take this to the next level um, yeah, in some way, whether it's a specific meeting or if you're just asking if they're interested, that's what Devin's talking about. Uh, exactly. Cool, okay, so that's- Acronyms are one of the things I always, you know, you, you, you say them so much time to yourself, you forget that other people don't always speak in, uh, in acronyms. So thanks for clarifying. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I dream in acronyms now. Like it's just all letters floating around in my head. Yeah. All right, should we jump to the next one? Yeah, let's do it. All right, the next one was a split. So I thought this might be a different tip, but here's what we wanted to do. So then what I thought, was, well, I wonder if this changes when you go from a cold email scenario where I don't know, where essentially I don't know you. And then now you're in a deal. So you're in this active sales cycle. So we ran the exact same analysis, the exact same, you know, what success means, but for emails in a deal cycle. And of course, because sales is nuanced and nothing is ever as it seems, it completely flips. And now asking for this specific day and time works better than the interest CTA. Worth noting the open CTA never wins first. I thought that was pretty funny. It's just middle of the pack. But if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because we were just saying, hey, if you're in a cold email scenario, I don't know you. I'm not in, I have an established interest. But once you've met with someone, that changes completely. And if you've, especially if you're in the middle and um, deeper into the sales cycle where you really know someone and you, your interest only is, is growing as you invest more time in this, it would make sense that you don't actually need to gauge interest. You have that established. And so with the specific CTA, the strength of it in this scenario is that you're removing all of the friction. You're making it really easy for someone to say yes or no, but here's another time. Again, when you go back to that, hey, Colin, are you free Thursday at four to talk about that unspoken objection I surfaced 10 minutes ago? Yeah. Yeah, course. right. Right. And this is when you get to those more, like if, you, if you've ever looked like for sellers, like maybe this is just me. I feel like you were way more poetic at the beginning of a sales cycle. You know, you're like really trying to craft that perfect cold email. You're really trying to be well-spoken. Maybe it's just me. Once I'm in a deal, it's like you get those two sentence emails. Like you're now like on texting basis, but it's over email or it's like, yeah, yeah that time works, send it over. Yeah, 2 p.m. You know what I mean? You get those really short messages and I think that's actually a good sign. So that's where the, the uh, specific CTA plays in. Interesting. So it flips. It flips. It'd be too, sales would be, we all know sales is challenging. It'd be way too easy if it was just the same. If it was just, yeah, you have to, just one, one thing to remember. Nope, sorry. That's really interesting. All right, let's get to the next one here. All right. This one was the first thing I published right when, uh, when the pandemic started, which was, we kind of talked about it, you know, buyers were saying, I need to think about it. And what they were thinking about and doing was talking to the CFO. Uh, we think we've all heard this in passing or directly in our own experiences. Budget holders, whether it's a CFO or a finance director, uh, was getting more and more involved. And so what I wanted to do is figure out, well, like, how can we, how can we at Gong equip sales leaders and sales pros to get these deals across the board, ones that are already in flight or, you know, in the next quarter or two, like we have to figure a way to make this happen. Um, I've never been a CFO, Colin, uh, believe it or not. So when I don't have the answer, I'm, I'm good at going and finding it. So what I did was I interviewed our CFO. Our CFO is Tim Ritters. Uh, he was over at Pure, I believe it was Pure Storage. Forgive me if I'm misquoting. I uh, used a CFO there and helped them to a successful IPO. And what he told me was the best way to get a deal done today is to prove how you're going to help increase remote productivity, new challenge, enhance visibility into their, into their business, existing challenge that now is worse, and or increase agility. Again, existing challenge that's now exacerbated. You have to come prepared to show how a specific investment will indeed save the company hard dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the folks listening right now are on demand. They sell growth, like uh, growth offerings, right? You, you know, you invest in this and you're going to see growth. Other folks sell cost savings. Buy this and you will spend less. The latter might have had a better, you know, an easier transition in this regard because you're used to showing hard ROI. Right. And growth-minded CFOs, which is what Tim called himself in his peer group, are we're very much used to the okay, cool, like you know, Devin, you want to go spend fifty grand for your team, and you think it's going to do this, that, and the other, and we'll get you know this number at the end. Okay, we can make that investment. 
not not so much you know in q2 and q3 and, and now it's kind of depends on you know the industry you're in in your company and so what he was saying was you really need to come prepared with a bulletproof you know business case of why the hell should i be spending right now and why this can't wait and what am i going to get out of it and the, the, that's why I really focused on remote productivity, enhanced visibility and agility, because those are new problems that I now have as a business operator. And so if you're not helping with these three things, and it's probably just not a not, uh, you know, it's a not now type type decision. Right, it becomes irrelevant because, because that's not the context that many people are are in, especially the CFO. Yeah. That's the, when they look out from their seat, you know, anything else is not relevant to them, right? Selling's a lot easier in a, in a good economy. Yeah, businesses sure. are booming people are hiring everyone's got jobs it's really easy it's not easy but it's much easier to sell uh than what we've been going through the last uh nine months the first three to six specifically and so this was his advice and my advice as well and i think it's never a bad thing to follow right even when we get back to a growth economy this is still a good mindset to keep I kind of want to hear if anybody in the chat has had has bumped into this um specifically trying to buy and a CFO kind of inserts themselves in the purchase process. Um, you know, what have you done? You have any questions about that? This feels like a, an interesting area to dig in as a group. I will say just from my experience, so I'm not a seller, but as somebody who has a budget and wants to spend it, my purchases have become more complicated and you know, that objection we talked about earlier, where it's like, I have to think about it, or I have to go talk internally. I've had to use that more, but it just being honest with sellers who are trying to sell something to me is because my purchasing process changed basically overnight in March. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of it does have to do with making a business case, but it's a different kind of business case. And I think Tim said it well. So Leslie Venets is back in the chat. She says her ICP is the CPO who reports to CFOs almost always. And as a trend, approve the CPO's budget. It's a headache. Yeah, I think you're not alone. The not C another. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I would say I, I actually love CFOs. I, mean, I, I like Tim. He's a great guy. Um, their job is kind of uh, indirectly to make salespeople's job harder. What I really mean is their job is to protect their business. Yeah. And you got to remember if a purchase goes bad, if they run out of money, if they don't have budget for something that's more important in three months because they spend it now, the CFO is the one that takes the heat there. So their job is to make it challenging for salespeople, which just tells me we need to adjust as salespeople and figure out how we can make it easier. What, what do, that's why I said, get in their head. What do they think like a CFO? What are all the things that like, what is their internal list? What are the things that they really care about? Another question I asked Tim, I was like, right now, Tim, what are the things you're saying no to like immediately? And what are the things you're saying yes to immediately? And he's like, I'm not even considering anything that doesn't have a really detailed business case. Mm. Yep. So that's what we need to do now. And I think it'll be, you know, it's tough if it's either a new, if it's either a new thing for sellers or if it's a, um, you know, V2, I, you know, I've done them before, but I haven't had to get this granular. It's only a skill that's going to pay off, you know, for the rest of your career. It's never a bad skill to have a, you know, to be able to think like a CFO and build a really bulletproof business case. Yeah, and hey, you know, if you had access to your CFO, maybe some of the people on this call have access to their CFO. Uh, you could go ask, you know, have this conversation with them too. Ask, you know, if, if CFOs are being inserted in your selling cycles, uh, get some advice from someone you know on your specific pitch, on your specific uh, business case. Yeah. I tell people all the time, interview your ICP, your internal ICP. Most people have them. Go interview them. Now, most and people are have... holding the budget. At your... Everyone has a budget holder. He just, <laughs> it just depends on what the title is. That's right. Uh, Nehal just added a uh, fill in the blank template. Oh, down yeah. In the chat. So check that out. That was uh, the two. I think she shared the 43 highly effective CTAs. That was our most popular piece of content this year. It's been downloaded over 15,000 times. CFO letter Congrats. template was a close, well, not even a close second. The CTAs did really well. I think uh, like seven or 8,000 people downloaded the CFO letter template. So that's help. incredible. Yeah. I mean, without knowing the 15,000 number, the 7,000 would, would still be my blame. <laughs> you're, uh, you're in good company. If you download and use, it'll, it'll help you. Uh, you know, CTAs, I think, are always good, but specifically in Q1 when we're building pipeline and the CFO letter 
end of year, end of month, end of quarter, always good stuff. Last thing to add on this comes from uh, Leslie again, is she likes to read the CEO statements and earnings reports. So she knows what the CFO is being asked to deliver, um, which is another good one. It gives you the context for the business that, you know, if you're not reading those 10 Ks and you're selling to a public company, yeah, you should start. It's, uh, it, it's interesting because that's like, selling to public companies is really hard. It takes a long time to talk about approval process, yeah. but you can get in the door with those 10 Ks and those statements, you know, those earning reports and all those, like it, it's not easy. It's quite tedious, but there's gold in those things and you can really learn a lot. All right, let's jump. Let's start thinking like a salesperson again. Last tip. It's okay to say F you to 2020. Just kidding. That's not the real tip, but I think it's something we all might feel uh, this year. The tip is it's okay to curse on sales calls. And I actually but... got a, another poll here too. Oh, okay. I'm kind of curious if anybody actually does this. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to launch that right now. It's another question coming at you. Just let us know. Answer. Give us answers. I'm going to vote too. So do <laughs> Maybe you ever don't curse? Know my manager was the first one. <laughs> Someone clicked. <laughs> Uh, Maybe don't tell my manager. Yeah, this one's kind of a scary one. So yeah, so far it's looking like mostly no, but I'm going to share the results here in a second. A couple more people can vote. There we go. That's so funny. Oh, oh I don't know. Can can the people viewing see the, the poll right now or only us? Here we go. Yeah, now they can. I shared it. Okay. All right, so this is the results. Uh, we got five people saying, yeah, they curse uh, on mm -hmm. calls with, prospects or customers 54 percent say no and then some of you sounds like you kind of do so this is actually more like uh close to an even split if you count the maybe says so yes i like the maybe don't tell my manager that could be like maybe like do i curse i don't i don't know but don't tell my manager either way that's why i started laughing um uh, so this was the only one we the only report so far that we've covered today that uh had nothing to do with the pandemic so you can curse out of the label. Uh, this was in January and uh, I myself was, uh, I might've been a sailor in a past life because I curse a lot. Now, always in jest, I like to think I never cursed out people. I never cursed at people. And on sales calls, I did find myself cursing, but again, never at a prospect. And so I kind of was like thinking of ideas. And I was like, I wonder if what I'm doing is like shooting me in the foot and I'm just like being pretty unprofessional or what it kind of feels like, like, I feel like it's a good thing when prospects curse with me, again, not at me, because it shows a level, you know, we talked about earlier, like authenticity, you're being your true self if you curse, right? Uh, so I wanted to look at the numbers. I was genuinely curious. I had no idea what I was going to find. Kind of gave the gave it away here a bit, but here's what we found. And this is by far the most fun, fun thing I've ever written. Cursing <laughs> actually had a positive correlation on win rates. But there's a caveat. So one, if you look at no cursing versus both sides curse, you see an 8% jump. And you almost see like the authenticity building here, which is like no one's cursing, assuming you do, if it's your style, not everyone does, it's okay. Versus like a little blip when the prospect only curses and a bigger blip when the rep curses and another blip when both curse. And so I think someone put in, I think it was Mike, might have, uh, if I was reading the, oops, sorry about that. I was seeing on the, uh, chat here was like you know i like a lot of sellers when this was posted was like i really like when my buyer curses it shows me they're comfortable i was like yeah that's exactly what it is they're being they're comfortable enough with me and it's usually some turning point in the sales process where i'm kind of leave the call like i think they're kind of into this deal like this feels really good and sometimes i would curse back and sometimes not what it really did for me was like it opened up the door if i wanted to slide a you know casual casual four letter word in there um and so, yeah, so it kind of just said like, hey, like if, if it's your style and you feel comfortable and your buyer curses first, you have Devin Reed's green light. Gong data shows that it's, it's not going to hurt you. That said, there are people in different uh, geogra you know, geographic locations. There are people from different religious backgrounds. And so you always need to just be very mindful and respectful. And again, I have to say it a hundred times because people in the comment when I post this were like, you're telling me to curse at my buyer? No, never curse at them. You know, you can say like, oh, this, my current technology is a piece of shit. Yeah, what do you got? It's, it's as simple as that. Something else that was funny is uh, 
you know, I had to send a list of curse words to our data science team to, uh, to, 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 re to report on. And I was like, this email gets in my HR manager's hand. Like what, 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 what am I going to say? Um, the most common words. And again, this was mostly the U S uh, was, was the S word, uh, 92%, uh, the F bomb brought in around 7%. And then all of your other creative imagination, uh, you know, get creative. That took about the the one percent. So if you're wondering what people are cursing, it's shit. Mostly shit. I feel like shit is the most acceptable curse word. Yeah, I mean that's the data would suggest that heavily. Uh, yeah. The f bomb might, you know, uh, you might be saying it at like kind of what the to like yourself or kind of like the general. Um, but you know, if you direct the F bomb at someone calling it's a uh, rough waters ahead. So it could show that, you know, who, who knows? I want to do a version right. of the UK and see if bloody is like the, like the yeah. swaps, swaps the F bomb. Right. Right. So, so does this mean like, this doesn't mean you curse to increase your close rate. This means cursing could be a sign that you and your prospect have enough rapport right. and a good enough relationship that you're, close rate could be higher right it's like a, a signpost to watch for more than it is a tactic to employ yeah i don't think i would call it a tactic at all <laughs> <laughs> i would say it's kind of like um i think at least for me i'll speak for myself i've been in especially earlier in my career i've been in i've been in a lot of deals and i was when i started my career i was very like buttoned up uh, i didn't you know i was like a little afraid to show who i really was i was like very you know very professional and I always think I kind of assumed the other person was doing the same, but I would hear them curse like, you know, and I saw the salespeople a lot in my career. So, you know, whatever that means. Uh, and I would hear it and I'm like, Oh, I wonder like, what does that mean? Is it good? Is it bad? Should I reciprocate? Should I bite my tongue? And again, I've always been kind of a cursor off, uh, off the sales floor. Um, and so that's really what I wanted to learn. And then, yeah, as I was digging into this article this year, it's exactly right. It's a form of authenticity. It's a form of bonding. We're breaking the rules together. We're being our true selves on a sales call. Mm. Uh, that builds rapport and it's and it reflects again correlation that you know have higher win rates. Um, but again, if cursing is not your style, and your buyer curses at you, well, you still got a little two percent bump here. There's nothing to be upset about. You don't have to reciprocate. You're 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 fine. There you go. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me. Uh, some other people were saying, you know, wait for the buyer to curse first, and then I cur I did the same thing. Um, yeah, always. And I had the sim I had a similar experience as you. As I started out very buttoned up, and as I became more comfortable and confident in my role, I was able to build rapport more. So they kind of just came hand in hand for me as well. Yeah, yeah, and and it's it's funny because I've done, I've cursed first to test the waters and when it's not reciprocated i'm always like ah oh, why did i why did i take that risk like why would you do that yeah. like you don't know what people do in their spare time you know who, you don't know what people like we you know and i mean they're like they're like you know they're uh, you know they could be they could be a pastor at a church on the weekends and you just cursed at this this guy or gal or you know they could uh who, who knows there's just so much you know unknown out there you don't want to make the first jump but like i said reciprocation is uh seems to be a safe bet there you go so uh real quick i want to ask uh in the chat if you remember to screenshot your favorite tip and post it on linkedin to wear to to uh, win some gong swag yeah we got hopefully gong. you remember if you didn't remember maybe we'll be nice enough to scroll back to your favorite tip and let you screenshot so you can win some gong swag by posting it on linkedin so i am that. so fine if you want to get the deck i'm actually going to send the deck instead of the uh data back sales tips here. I think the deck is, is better. Uh, and Nahal sh shared a bunch of our top content for this year. So you should be fully, you know, just loaded when it comes to sales content by the end of this thing. But yeah, post uh, post uh, your favorite takeaway, uh, tag gong so we can find your post and uh, we'll, we'll hook up with some, some, some swag. There it is. Uh, hope everybody learned something today. I know I did. I actually spent a couple hours looking at this deck before this conversation and just having my mind blown again and again. Um, so always a pleasure, Devin. Thanks so much for stopping by. Of course. Like Devin said, if you all don't follow Gong on LinkedIn, uh, you're missing out. Some really amazing stuff that they publish. And from that whole team, uh, Devin, Nihal, your data science team, praise from me. Um, and thanks to the audience, everybody, for stopping by today, making it interesting, having some fun conversations. If you ever want to have more conversations like this, 
of course, we do two webinars a week, almost every week. Um, and also you can head over to saleshacker.com and join in some of the discussions there. If you create an account, you can talk about whatever you want anytime. So uh, yeah, any, any last words of wisdom you wanna leave people with, Kevin? I have no more wisdom. I have given you my 2020 wisdom. Uh, have a good holiday season. Thanks for hanging out with us. And yeah, follow Gong if you wanna hang out with me, follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, I post uh, Gong Labs once or twice a month. So happy to share what we know. All right, appreciate you. We'll see you soon, Devin. Have a great new year, man. Later. Bye, everybody.